story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. I've got to, a confession to make. I hated history at school. I was taught by a retired vicar who managed to make it more dull and more boring than any other subject. It was dates, battles, kings and queens. Did you have it like that? It all seemed so complicated and so irrelevant. What was the point? What was the use of learning it all except to pass an exam? And my knowledge of history finished up very much like that book 1066 and all that. Have you read that in which everything was either a good thing or a bad thing? Funnily enough, the book of Kings is very like that. The kings were either very good or very bad, you know. He was a bad king, he was a good king. Much of the Bible, of course, is history, but it's the history of just one nation. There's no history of China or India, much less America here. It's just the history of one people because it's their history that's important to God. Other history may be interesting, but this history is absolutely vital for the whole of mankind. Now, we are into the second phase of the leadership of Israel, but I've got a little diagram here, which um, I just want to point to. Here's the year 2000 BC, here's the one, 1000 BC, and here's 500 BC took them a thousand years from Abraham up to David to get everything that God wanted them to have. They had a few hiccups, for example, they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and then even after they got into the land, they had a lot of attacks from Midianites and other people, and there were real setbacks, but they went on, and gradually they got into the empire ruled over by King David. And the books of the Bible that cover this history are Genesis, and then four altogether, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel. But with kings, we're on the downhill. Both books of kings describe how they lost all that it took them a thousand years to get, how they lost it all. And on the way down, very quickly after Solomon, there was civil war, and there's a split then, between ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south, and they never got it together again. So now there wasn't one people Israel. The ten tribes in the north kept the title Israel because uh, there were ten of them. And the two in the south gave themselves the title of Judah because Judah was the big one and the remnant of Benjamin was so small. So you had civil war. The ten tribes in the north just went steadily downhill all the way until finally all ten were taken away into Assyria. In the south, however, they had some hiccups upwards, as there'd been hiccups downwards there. There were a couple particularly under a very good king, Hezekiah, and under a boy king who began to reign at the age of eight, Josiah. But that didn't stop the downward trend permanently, and finally the two tribes were taken away to Babylon. They finished up where they'd begun. There were slaves in Egypt here, now they're taken away to Assyrian Babylon. It's a tragic story. One of the main purposes of reading it is that it can happen to the church as well, and does happen. You can gain it all, and you can lose it all, and you tend to lose it more quickly than you've gained it. It's very important to study why they lost it all, what made them go downhill. Just to complete this little diagram, they did come back after 70 years, but they never got their freedom again. They were then ruled by priests rather than prophets or princes. And they were occupied by the Egyptians, by the Syrians, by the Greeks. They had a terrible time under a Greek called Antiochus Epiphanes for three and a half years. He did the most terrible things. He sacrificed pigs on the temple altar, erected a statue of Zeus in the temple and turned the temple vestries into brothels. And he is a picture of Antichrist. He was the worst they ever had. And then the, finally the Romans. And then you get the son of David, Jesus, because Joseph and Mary kept their family tree. And they were descended from King David. And so you've got, in a sense, the fulfillment of a thousand years 
500 years, a thousand years later when Jesus, son of David, comes. Well, that's just to show you where we are when we study the book of Kings. We studied Samuel and that took us up to the peak. But now Kings covers from there right down to there. 500 years. But oh, what a sad story. Let's just pick up some of these threads again. I told you that the leadership of Israel went through different phases. There were first the patriarchs for about 500 years, then prophets from Moses to Samuel led them, then kings from Saul to Zedekiah, and then after they got back, priests. And that should be Joshua, not Zerubbabel. It was Joshua who was the priest right through to Annas and Caiaphas. And so we're looking at the story of the kingdom of Israel in the book of Kings when they were led by kings. But in Hebrew, the book is called the kingdoms of Israel, not the kings. In English, it's the book of the kings, but in Hebrew, the book of the kingdoms. And that is because the word kingdom has a particular meaning in Hebrew, which it doesn't have in English. In English, a kingdom means a piece of land, a realm. And so we are part of the United Kingdom. I have news for you. It's not united and it's not a kingdom. But otherwise, that's not a bad name for it. <laughs> but we tend to think of it as something on the map. For the Hebrew, a kingdom was a reign rather than a realm. It was something that was defined in terms of authority, not in terms of area. It was essentially the degree of power not the amount of property that a king had. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're not talking about a place, we're talking about a power. We're talking about a reign or a rule. And of course, we are complicated by the fact that we're in what's called a constitutional monarchy, where the queen reigns, but she doesn't rule. John Major rules for the time being. But... Uh, so we've robbed the throne of its ruling power. And therefore, the throne has very little power in our country. The big advantage of it is, however, that it keeps power out of other people's hands so that our armed forces and our courts of law are not under the government directly but are responsible to the Queen. And it just saves too much power getting into politicians' hands. So it's not so much valued our monarchy for the power it wields as the power it keeps from others. You follow me? But in a, a true kingdom, the king has absolute power. He makes the laws. There is no parliament. There are no votes. There are no opposition parties. The king rules. And he rules by decree and not by debate. He makes a law. And everybody's got to toe the line. And uh, would you like to live in a kingdom? Would you wish that one man ruled England and made all the laws with no parliament, no elections, no votes? You're not sure. I can convince you in two minutes. If I could find the right king who would be absolutely just, who would lay down his life for the people, who would see that there were no poor and no sick uncared for, now would you like to be in the kingdom? You see, the kingdom depends entirely on the character of the king. If you've got a good king, the kingdom's by far the best form of government. But if you've got a bad king, it's the worst of all. And that's why we prefer democracy, because it prevents any one person getting that much power. But as Churchill said, democracy is the worst possible form of government, except all the others. <laughs> and he meant it was probably the safest. Because the trouble is, as you read history, there have been ten times more bad kings than good kings. And as Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And when you put all the power in one man's hands, you can go very far astray because he can be corrupted by that power. We call it a dictatorship now, but that's what a kingdom was. So we need to understand the Hebrew title for these books is the kingdoms of Israel. And a kingdom was the rule of a man. And his kingdom ceased when he ceased. And another kingdom began. So whereas we talk about the kingdom of Israel, they talked about the kingdoms, plural, of Israel, one after the other. I just mention that because if you want to understand the phrase the kingdom of God, that's the background. 
you won't understand it from the phrase United Kingdom, but you do need to understand it from the Book of Kings. So that the king's character and his conduct decided the fate of the nation. Until Israel had a king, the history books talk about what the people did. But as soon as they had a king, the history books of the Bible only talk about what the king did. Because you could assume that what the king did, everybody else would do. They would follow him and he would say, this is my law, you keep it or else. And so they followed the king and his character was the biggest factor. If a good king, they were in peace. A bad king, they found themselves at war. And so in, in the book of Kings, the emphasis is on the ruler, what he did and whether he was a good king or a bad king. And that was measured very simply by one standard, David. If he was like David, he was a good one. If he was not like David, he was a bad one. David became the kind of yardstick, mainly in his earlier years before his downfall. And people looked, is he like David? Does he live like his father David did? That's how they judged. But behind that was a deeper reason. If they lived like David, they did what was good in the sight of the Lord. If they didn't, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And as you read Kings, it's very simple. They're either good or evil kings. I've told you how Samuel was told they wanted a king and told them kings come expensive. In fact, he tried to say, you already have a king. God is your king. Do you know, way back in the days of the judges, when Gideon defeated the Midianites, they came to Gideon and said, we want you to be our king and to start a dynasty. We want your son to inherit the throne after you and then your grandson. We want a king. And Gideon was very wise. Gideon said, I will not be your king. You already have one. God is your king. But I'm afraid they later changed their minds and they got their kings. Now it's very interesting, this is not a straight history book in the normal sense because um, the proportion of pages given to each king varies so much. For example, there was a king called Omri in the north who had an outstanding reign. Politically, he was a genius. Economically, he lifted them. He did a tremendous, he was a mighty king and yet he's dismissed in the book of Kings in seven verses. Because however efficient he was at kinging, he did evil what, what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So in God's sight, whatever great achievements he had, nothing. See, That's how God judges prime ministers. They may achieve tremendous things, but God doesn't look at that. He says, how did he live? What did he believe? How did he behave? And therefore... Uh, you get um, another king to whom whole chapters are devoted. And this proportion tells you an awful lot about God's point of view. It is certainly based on history, but it is a selection. No history is objective. When anybody sits down to write history, they do three things. Number one, they select. Selection is the first thing they have to do, which means out of everything that's happened, you select what you think is important. The next step of this historian is connection. He then have, has to show how the things he has selected connect with one another, how this led to that. And the third step is explanation as to why this led to that. So every historian goes through these three steps of selection, connection, and explanation. And therefore, he is entirely governed by what he thinks is important and how he thinks these events connect up and why he thinks A leads to B leads to C. And here we have not objective history. There's no such thing. We have subjective history, but it's God writing. That is why, as I've told you, in the Old Testament, the books of Samuel and Kings are called the former prophets along with Joshua and Judges because this is history written by prophets, written from a prophetic point of view, from God's angle. And it's God who's selecting what is important. It's God who's connecting things up. It's God who's explaining why things have happened and turned out as they have. So we're not reading history. We're actually reading prophecy. 
and it comes in the second part of the Jewish Old Testament. They have the law, which is the first five books, the law of Moses, the prophets, both the former and the latter prophets, and the writings, which is a kind of miscellaneous collection of everything else like Psalms and Proverbs. They have the latter prophets, and they're Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. Now we tend to call these books history, and those books prophecy, but they were wiser. The Jews say, no, it's former prophets and later prophets, or latter prophets. Got it? Well now, let's uh, move on. And we're studying the history of the kingdom of Israel. This is holy history. It's history with a moral, a record with a message. It's not just a lesson about history, but it's a lesson from history. There's a big difference. Somebody says history repeats itself. It has to because nobody listens. And others have said that uh, if you forget the past, you are condemned to relive it. And that's why history is important because otherwise we're going to make the same mistakes and we're not going to learn. And that's why we read this history. It's about history and a lesson from history. And there's such a clear pattern if you add up the reigns, or as the Jews would say, the kingdoms of each king, you will find an astonishing fact. Add the number of years together and divide by the number of kings, and you will find this, that every good king reigned on average 33 years. Isn't that interesting? But every bad king reigned on average 11 years. That's how history works out. On the whole, you will find through history that good governments last longer than bad ones. And good rulers last longer than bad ones. If you average it out, that is what demonstrates God's control of history. We do live in a moral universe. And bad rulers tend to be shorter. In this case, one third shorter. If the good kings reign on average 33 and the bad kings on average 11, then it's saying quite simply, God will keep good kings on the throne three times as long as bad ones. Right? And that's why we're told so carefully how long each king reigned, so that you can work all this out. It means that when you read the book of Kings, you do need to do your sums and to do a bit of thinking about what you're reading. Otherwise it just says, oh, and he reigned for 30 years and he reigned for 15 years. You say, how boring. No, it isn't. It's fascinating. See, when you work it out mathematically, you find that God is in charge of history. And that still applies right through history. Good civilizations have lasted longer than bad ones because God is on the throne. Well now, the kingdom, as we call it, of Israel went through three stages. The first was the United Kingdom. <laughs> And there were three kings that reigned over the whole of Israel, all 12 tribes, but only three. The first was Saul, and he was a baddie. Second was David, he was a goodie. And the third was Solomon, he was a mixture. But in fact, God gave united Israel three reigns of exactly 40 years each. Now that is significant because 40 is always the number of God testing people. 40 days in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness. 40 is God's number of, um, what's the word I'm wanting, before he approves or disapproves. It's the trial period. 40 years is a trial period in God's sight. And so when all the tribes were together, God gave these three kings a full trial period. This was a test of kingship. But I'm afraid they failed the test. All of them started well. All of them finished badly. And yet one of them was still a man after God's own heart. But none of them was good right through the 40 years. So the United Kingdom failed. 1 Samuel covers Saul's 40 years, 2 Samuel covers David's 40 years, and 1 Kings 1 to 10 covers Solomon's 40 years. 
As soon as Solomon died, the north and the south split and had civil war. There had been a growing tension, I've told you already, because all the prosperity seemed in the south, around the capital, and all the poverty seemed to hit the north. And there was a lot of uh, grumbling going on in the north that uh, the government in Jerusalem was only interested in the southeast. Sorry. You know what I mean? We, we know this only too well. And it happens that where the king and the government is, there's, there's more prosperity and more interest in things happening. And uh, so as soon as Solomon died, no one could hold the 12 tribes together. Two tribes stayed in the south and they kept the capital and the royal line. The 10 tribes in the north lost both. And so they didn't have a place of worship and they didn't have the royal line of David. So what did they do? They set up their own centers of worship, two of them, Bethel and Dan, and to give some object for people to, to attract attention of the people, they set up two huge golden calves in Bethel and Dan. And they elected their own king, a man called Jeroboam. Interestingly enough, I've got the seal of Jeroboam there. It's got the lion on it. That's always been the symbol of Israel. And uh, there's Jeroboam's name. And uh, that seal is a copy, yes, I know. But it was, it, it was dug up at Megiddo. And uh, there's the very seal of the man they elected, Jeroboam. And uh, he was not of the royal line of David. And from then on, in the north, they had one dynasty after another. They had assassination, they had coup d'etat, they had takeovers. And it's, it's a very sad tale. So they had centers of worship with golden calves. And they had kings, usually self-elected, who just killed the previous king. And the story in the north is really quite sad. Furthermore... For 80 years after the split, there was war between the north and the south. In fact, the tribes in the north, on one occasion, actually made a treaty with Syria and Damascus to wipe out the two little tribes in the south. That was uh, during the days of Isaiah, and you can read all about it in Isaiah. They had 80 years' war, then they had a bit of peace, 80 years of peace. Notice that these 80s are twice 40s, but they had a time of peace between the north and the south, but it was during that time of peace that God sent them two prophets who play a huge part in the book of Kings. Elijah in 1 Kings 17 to, 20, to 2 Kings chapter 2 and Elisha followed him. You can see that these two prophets were terribly, terribly important in the north during that time when the north and south weren't fighting. But I'm afraid after Elijah and Elisha, they went back to war and fought each other and played each other dirty tricks again. And it wasn't long before Assyria came and took the ten tribes called Israel off to Assyria in 721 BC. They became the ten lost tribes. They're not totally lost because God knows where they are. They're scattered, but the book of Revelation promises that God will bring those twelve tribes back from wherever they've been. So God knows. He keeps a record. And now we're left with a single kingdom. It's a very small kingdom now. Just Judah and little Benjamin in the south. A little bit of land around Jerusalem. But they still have the capital city. They still have the royal line of David. And their kings are still descended from David. But wouldn't you have thought that when they saw ten of their fellow tribes taken off, that they would say, hey, we must pull our socks up? Or God will send us away too? You'd have thought that, wouldn't you? If ten members of your family were kidnapped and disappeared, and you were told by God, and you too will disappear if you don't behave yourselves, wouldn't you pull your socks up? No, no. The tragedy is that they didn't either. And God never punishes anyone without warning them first. It's a lovely thing about God. He said through the prophet Amos, I'll never do a thing unless I send a prophet first to tell people what I'm going to do. That's why God sent Elijah and Elisha to the north, and why he later sent Amos and Hosea, but Hosea was the last. 
and after Hosea, no more. After that, God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to the two tribes that were left. He sent Isaiah, he sent Micah, he sent uh, Nahum, he sent so many, and yet they didn't listen either. And the tragedy is that in 587 BC, notice that's about 140 years later, little Judah was taken away this time to Babylon. And that's the end of the story of the book of Kings. I've given you a sort of oversight there. Keep it in mind that when you read the book of Kings, you're reading, first of all, the United Kingdom under Solomon. Then you're reading the Divided Kingdom. And during that time, it's very disturbing. You're constantly going from one side to the other. Have you noticed when you read it? And the king of Judah did this, and then the king of Israel did that, and then the king of Judah. And he's trying to keep up with them both. It's really quite confusing. We'd much rather he told us the whole story of the north and then the whole story of the south. But he does it because they were interacting either in war or peace with each other. So he's got to keep up the two stories simultaneously. Then it simplifies when we're left with only the two tribes in the south, Judah, from which we get the word Jew. The word Jew doesn't come earlier than this. It's Hebrew before this, or Israeli, or Israelite. But now, for the first time, the word Jew comes in, a word that became very, very common in the gospel story when Jesus came. But you realize that, I'm just throwing this in because for centuries, Christians have misunderstood John's gospel, which keeps saying the Jews killed Jesus. And I'm afraid the Christian church has included all Jews in this and really done terrible things to the Jewish people for 20 centuries. You Jews killed Jesus. But when John, the writing his gospel, says the Jews killed Jesus, he doesn't mean all the Israelis. He means the people of Judah. In other words, the people of Jerusalem in the south. He is not including the Galileans. The Galileans flocked to Jesus. They loved him. It was only when he went south to Judah and Jerusalem that the Jews hated him. Do you follow me? So when you read the Jews in the Gospel of John, don't think that's all the Israelis. It's the southerners, not the northerners. I just throw that in because it, we could have avoided centuries of misunderstanding had we realized that. Jew means someone from Judah. And of course, since these two tribes came back afterwards from the exile, it was just Jews who came back, and that's why the name has stuck ever since. Hope that's explained a little something to you. Well, now let's ask a few basic questions. Who wrote this book or these books? How did he write it? When did he write it? And why did he write it? Who? We don't know. Most Jews think it was Jeremiah. It's like him. There are parts of the book of Kings that are identical in wording with parts of the book of Jeremiah. And we know that the prophets wrote history because they saw it God's way. So it could be Jeremiah. Others think it's Ezekiel. I think it was Jeremiah for one reason. He's not mentioned. But he was right in the middle of this. And there's not a word about him. And uh, I cannot think that anybody else would write about this period of history and never mention Jeremiah. But if he was writing it himself, he wouldn't. He'd written his prophecies down separately. And there are one or two other pointers. So for my money, it was Jeremiah. But uh, we don't know. We have to leave that question. So how was it written? Well, time and again in the book of Kings, it says, as it is written in the Acts of Solomon, as it is written in the books of the Chronicles of the King of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, he is clearly using national records. He's using other people's records and weaving them together to communicate a lesson about history. There are even parts of Isaiah which are word for word the same as Kings. So whether Isaiah was writing those bits or Jeremiah got them from Isaiah, I don't know. But he was using the normal historical method. He was using his sources, gathering material from libraries, but then he was putting it together in such a way that we'd get a, a profound lesson from looking at what happened. When was it written? Well, a lot of it was written before they were taken away to Babylon because he mentions that the temple is still standing and he frequently uses this phrase as it is to this day 
as you go through the book of Kings, you'll constantly find things as it is to this day. So clearly he was writing before the whole thing collapsed. And yet, the last little bit of Kings finishes halfway through the exile in Babylon with a most extraordinary little piece of news. The Babylonians had killed the last king of Judah, a man called Zedekiah. They'd been very horrible to him. They'd tied him up in chains and then they'd lined up his sons in front of him and they'd killed every son of Zedekiah. And then when he'd seen all his sons die, they took, out, took his eyes out and blinded him and took him away in chains. That was Zedekiah. The previous king, however, Jehoiakim, was a weak king and he hadn't tried to oppose the Babylonians. So, in fact, they had taken him as prisoner. And the last thing in the book of Kings is that Nebuchadnezzar, that's the king of Babylon, released their second last king from prison and invited him to dine at the king's table from then on. Now that's very, very interesting. It's the last bit of news in the book of Kings. It means that it was completed halfway through the exile. And that's very significant, as you'll see in a minute. And it means that this royal line of David actually began to have its, have its meals at the king's table in Babylon. And you'll find that man's name in the genealogy of Jesus because the royal line of David was thus preserved by Nebuchadnezzar and came back. And the royal line came back in the person of a man called Zerubbabel. But we'll know more about him when we study another book. So all through this, disaster after disaster, horror after horror, the royal line was kept, but they lost even Jerusalem the city of God's name. Well, now, that brings us to the most important question, why was it written? We can now see a clear reason. Here is an entire nation that has lost its land, lost its capital, been taken away forcibly, and that generation will never see home again. And they must have talked like this. God's deserted us. God doesn't love us anymore. Why has God let this happen to us? It's the sort of thing you would ask if this happened to you and your children and you'd been forcibly removed from your land and knew you'd never see home again. You'd be full of questions. Where's God? Our God has let this happen to us. The whole of the book of Kings is an answer to why has God let this happen. The writer is saying it's your own fault. God hasn't broken his promises to you. He's kept them. He promised to do this to you if you misbehaved. So don't you blame God. God has kept his promise. And he's using all these records of the kingdoms of the slide down to show them that one thing is certain. God is faithful to his word. This is not an accident. You caused it to happen because you knew what God had said he would do and yet you ignored him. But then that's human nature. We know deep down that God will judge us one day for how we live. What do we do about it? See, human nature is so perverse, so stiff-necked, to use God's adjective, that we go on living in a way that we know makes God angry. And we trade on his patience. Like the German poet Heine, who was an atheist Jew, and who finished up in Paris and died young after a lifetime of sin. They called a priest to hear his confession. He refused to get, make a confession. He just said as he lay dying, Dieu me pardonnera, c'est son métier. God will forgive me, that's his trade. And Heine's dying words go down as someone who took advantage of God's patience and didn't realize that God's patience can run out. It took hundreds of years, but in the long term, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small. 
We need to remember that judgment does come. Sooner or later, we pay. Well, that's why the book is written. And it just uses history as a profound lesson to these people. And yet there is hope, even in this dark book, there's hope because God has promised never to break his part of the covenant. Again and again, I've underlined it every time it comes in the Old Testament. God says, you may break the covenant, I never will. Therefore, when you are taken away to another land, I will bring your children back. God keeps his promise. He never breaks a word. He promised he'd take them out of the land. But he prom promised to bring their children back. And he did. There were 70 years in Babylon. Do you know why? Probably told you before. Because God had made a law that they must let the soil rest every seventh year. Let it have a holiday so that it could be rejuvenated. And they had ignored it for all those 500 years from Solomon onwards. Now, if you work that out, how many years holiday had the land missed? 70. And God said, if you won't give the land a rest, I will. And you stay out of the land until it's caught up with its holidays. It's all there. It all fits together. And so that's why it's written. If it was Jeremiah, he said, I'm going to write the history of the last 500 years so that the people will get the message. This disaster has come on the whole 12 tribes because they didn't keep the covenant. But it's not hopeless. God has promised to keep the royal line of David going. He's promised to bring the children back. And he will do that too.